Lingue originali Lingue originali, episodio dedicato alla letteratura in lingua inglese. Bentrovati da Dario Albertini. Il libro che è al centro della nostra attenzione e dal quale Marco Piovaz da alcune settimane sta estraendo dei brani da leggervi in lingua inglese si intitola Middle England ed è di Jonathan Coe. Poeta scrittore, attore, personaggio veramente eclettico, ho già avuto modo di dirlo, e particolarmente attento agli usi e costumi del, del suo paese, il Regno Unito, l'Inghilterra, le Midlands in particolare, la regione di Birmingham, Manchester, siamo lì, a nord-ovest di, di Londra. Se non avete seguito gli episodi precedenti, che come sempre sono lo dico, due trasmissioni in una, c'è cioè prima l'introduzione in lingua italiana e poi la, letteratura in, la lettura scusate, in lingua inglese, vado un po' a riepilogare per chi ci raggiungesse soltanto in questa occasione. Uh, vi faccio un esempio, c'è una rubrica del TG2 che segue il TG delle 13 che si intitola Costume e Società. Beh, se voi prendete questo titolo e pensate al libro di Jonathan Coe Middle England, ah, è pubblicato in Italia da Feltrinelli, eh? avete fatto centro, perché eh, Jonathan Coe eh, scrive un romanzo, sì, è un romanzo, se volete potremmo definirlo una saga familiare, ma anche no, ci descrive come una famiglia inglese vive il cambiamento in quella nazione fra il pe nel periodo fra il 2010 e il 2018. Siamo nel pre-Brexit. Eh, io parlo sempre di Brexit, poi c'è qualcuno, soprattutto giovanissimo, che mi dice ma cos'è la Brexit? Beh, non possiamo eh, esaurire l'argomento in due battute. Diciamo che il Regno Unito per tanti anni ha fatto parte dell'Unione Europea, quindi per fare degli esempi molto semplici, per andare a Londra non ci serviva il passaporto, bastava la carta d'identità, adesso serve il passaporto. Altro esempio, ehm, io ho degli amici che si sono trasferiti in Inghilterra e hanno spedito alcuni dei loro effetti personali, cosa che un tempo sarebbe stata... Qualcosa, sarebbe stato qualcosa di assolutamente indolore, beh hanno dovuto pagare la dogana. Questa è una delle conseguenze per la gente comune come me e come voi della, della Brexit. È un cambiamento, è una scelta di, eh, di autonomia che ha avuto degli impatti e ha degli impatti anche sulla vita delle persone evidentemente. Beh, questi impatti si ritrovano in Middle England di Jonathan Coe, di cui adesso Marco Piovaz ci legge un'altra pagina. Benjamin was driving from Shrewbury to Retnal again, following the course of the River Severn through the towns of Cressage, March Wenlock, Bridge North, Enville, Stourbridge and Hagley. He had been driving this way there and back at least twice a week for the last year now. 200 journeys or more. No wonder that he now felt he knew every bend in the road, every landmark, every traffic roundabout, every pub, every petrol station, every Tesco Express, every garden center, every old church that had now been converted into flats. He knew where the worst queues were likely to be and where you could find a rat run to bypass a particularly troublesome set of traffic lights. Not that he needed to do that today. The roads were quiet. The cold snap, which had brought some snow to these parts at the beginning of the month, had receded, giving way to cloudy skies and mild temperatures. Dull, nondescript weather, which suited the journey and suited the occasion. It was a Saturday morning like any other. It was Christmas Day, a day that Benjamin had come to loathe with passion. 
He pulled up outside his father's house just after 11 o'clock. The house where he had grown up, the house his parents had bought in 1955, a red brick detached house with an extension added over the garage in the early 1970s. He knew the house so well now that he no longer saw it, no longer noticed it, and as such, he no longer knew it at all, and would probably have found it difficult to describe in any detail to a stranger. The only thing he noticed this morning was that the plants in the window box outside the living room were all dead, and looked as though they had been that way for months. Inside, he could see that all was reasonably clean and chip-shape as usual. He was paying for a cleaner to come in once a week, on Thursdays, as he didn't trust his father to look after the place. On the draining board in the kitchen were a single plate, a single knife and fork, a beer glass and a frying pan. Since the death of his wife, Colin had not cooked himself a meal that required anything more complicated than a frying pan. He would fry some tomatoes and have them on toast with a fried egg. Perhaps some mushrooms, if he was feeling adventurous. The only time this diet would vary was when Benjamin cooked for him, or took him out for dinner somewhere. Today, at least, he would be getting a decent roast lunch. Colin was wearing a patterned jumper of the sort favoured by golfing celebrities and daytime TV presenters in the 1980s. When he came downstairs from his latest visits to the bathroom, he was carrying a plastic bag containing a number of inexpertly wrapped presents. The only concession to Christmas anywhere in the house, as far as Benjamin could see. I thought you were going to buy a Christmas tree, he said. I did. It's out the back. Benjamin looked out of the kitchen window and saw the tree leaning up against the wall of the garden shed, still enclosed in its plastic netting. Well, that was a waste of money, wasn't it? I'll put it up tomorrow. Tomorrow will be too late. What about decorations? Mum always put up some decorations. Oh, I couldn't be bothered to get them down from the attic. Maybe next year, when I'm feeling a bit more chipper. Are you just going to stand around criticising, or can we go now? Benjamin looked at his watch. It was only ten past eleven. They had masses of time to get to Lois's. Where's your overnight bag? I've changed my mind. You can bring me back here after dinner. I don't want to stay with your sister. It's too much trouble all round. Benjamin sighed. The change of plans annoyed him for selfish reasons. Now I'll have to stay here with you. Why? You can't be alone on Christmas night. Why not? I'm alone every other night. You do what you like, don't worry about me. The last thing I want to be is a burden. Having to calm his father's repeatedly expressed fear of becoming a burden was one of the few truly burdensome things about being in his company. But Benjamin had learned that there was nothing to be gained by arguing. He picked up the bag of presents and escorted Colin to the car. Lois and Christopher, Sophie, Benjamin and Colin sat around the lunch table, tittering. Gravy-soaked towers of turkey and vegetables rising on the plates in front of them paper crowns on their heads. The atmosphere was bordering on funeral. We're doing this for dead, Lois had insisted to her brother in the kitchen. He doesn't want us to. The whole thing's a complete waste of time. Well, thanks a lot. That's really helpful. I could have stayed at home then. Isn't this your home? Nobody seems to know nowadays. They ate in near silence. Benjamin tried reading out some of the jokes from the crackers, but they felt lumpen, with all the sparkle of random quotations from one of the gloomier Ingman Bergman films. The only person to smile was Sophie, and that turned out to be not in a response to the joke, 
but a text message. Who was that from? Lois asked, uh, as only a mother could. Ian, Sophie answered, just wishing me a happy Christmas. Where's he spending it then? With his mother. New boyfriend, Christopher explained to his father-in-law, pronouncing the phrase loudly and slowly in the mistaken belief that Colin was going deaf. Good o, said Colin. Not before time. You could do with some grandkids, you two. Sophie took a sip of wine and said, Jumping the gun a bit, aren't you, granddad? It's not even my boyfriend. We've only been on two dates. Well, somebody's got to continue the family line, calling blundered on. The rest of you haven't exactly excelled in that department. Give it a rest, Dad, said Benjamin. There are five of us around this table. Is that it? Is that the best you lot can manage? Your mother and I had three kids. I thought there'd be a few more little trotters in the world by now. The silence that followed this outburst was more awkward and profound than ever. Everyone else around the table knew something that Colin didn't. Benjamin already had a daughter who lived in California, from whom he was estranged. I'm sure Paul will soon find someone in Tokyo, said Louis. He'll probably come and visit you in a few years with a whole army of pretty little half-Japanese children. Colin scowled and attacked his sprouts. After lunch, they all went for a walk, all except Colin, who crashed out on the sofa with the radio times and complained that there was nothing on television. What do you think I bought this for? Benjamin asked, waving Colin's present at him. It was a DVD of more Cambrian Wise Christmas specials. I don't want to watch old stuff. Yeah, but you don't like any of the new stuff. Benjamin crouched down by the television and inserted the DVD. As he did so, a vivid memory recurred. Christmas Day 1977, 33 years earlier, when he and his family had sat down to watch these two comedians' final show for the BBC. His grandparents had been there too, and in laughing along with them, Benjamin could remember feeling this incredible sense of oneness, a sense that the entire nation was being briefly, fugitively drawn together in the divine act of laughter. 27 million people used to watch this, you know, he reminded his father. Because we only had three channels. Lois had entered the room and was standing behind him, and there was nothing else to do. Are you ready? It'll be dark before we set out at this rate. The four of them set off together, strolling through the quiescent back streets, which only the occasional muted display of Christmas decorations or fairy lights made less ordinary today. Soon Benjamin was lagging behind, lost in his private thoughts, as usual. Sophie noticed and lingered, waiting for him to catch up. Everything okay? she asked. I'm fine. He smiled and put his arm around her briefly, rubbing her back in a clumsy gesture. Thanks for my present, by the way. So thoughtful. You don't really like him, do you? Sophie had given Benjamin a copy of Fallopia that she had bought on the night of Soan's interview with the two famous writers. It was inscribed, To Benjamin, all the best, Lionel Hampshire. Well, the reviews for this one have been a bit mixed, Benjamin said, but I'm looking forward to it. What was he like in person? Just what you'd expect. Oh, dear. They had arrived at the Tolkien Museum, and behind it, the little stretch of grassland that had recently been designated the Shire Country Park, both of which set off a train of thought in Sophie's mind. 
That was the night, she said, that Soan pointed out how Sarah Hall was an anagram of Ars Hall. How could we all have missed that for so long? Benjamin didn't answer. He was looking ahead at Lois and Christopher, walking arm in arm, in a way which almost gave them the air of a happily married couple. He was annoyed with his sister for making that sarcastic comment about the dearth of TV channels in the 1970s, which undermined, without her realising it probably, one of his most cherished early memories. It was still a cornerstone of his belief system that Britain had been a more cohesive, united, consensual place during his childhood. All that had started to unravel with the election result of 1979, and the fuzzy glow he still got from watching 70s comedy shows was proof of that somehow. But of course, for Lois, none of that could be expected to register. For her, that decade had been a time of tragedy, of horror. He told himself that he must never forget that and never stop making allowances for it. A sharp reminder awaited him when they returned home, in any case. Colin had given up on more came than wise and was watching the BBC News. He looked stricken. Lois sat down beside him while Benjamin went into the kitchen to put the kettle on. You all right, Dad? she asked. It's that woman, he said tonelessly, eyes not leaving the screen. That girl in Bristol, the one who went missing last week. They found a body now. They haven't said it's her, but, well, who else can it be? Lois said nothing but her whole body tautened. Christopher sat down on the arm of the sofa and put his hand on her clenched, twisted shoulder. This was the tableau Benjamin saw when he re-entered the room, his sister frozen with the men on either side of her. What her parents must be going through, Colin said, looking up at Christopher now, his eyes pale and liquid. I know exactly how they feel. Now he clutched his daughter's arm with a quick, violent passion. Years ago, we almost lost her, you know. Benjamin watched, hesitated, realised that he had no role and withdrew. As he made silently for the kitchen, he could hear his father repeating, we almost lost her. A Lingue Originali con tre episodi ogni settimana vi diamo la possibilità di ascoltare grande letteratura, anche contemporanea, in lingua inglese, tedesca e francese. Vi presentiamo autori che magari nel vostro percorso di lettori non avete mai incontrato. Vi raccontiamo anche le opere da cui poi leggiamo in lingua madre, ma soprattutto eh, speriamo di incuriosirvi affinché anche in edizione italiana voi and- andiate in libreria ad acquistare i libri di cui parliamo. Eh, nel caso specifico il libro si intitola Middle England ed è di Jonathan Co, pubblicato da Feltrinelli. Vi ricordo gli altri episodi quello con la letteratura in lingua tedesca con Nadia Meroni e quello con la letteratura in lingua francese con Barbara Marchand. L'uscita sul canale streaming è il venerdì, il sabato e la domenica alle ore 22, poi tutti gli episodi li trovate in podcast. Io sono Dario Albertini, vi ringrazio per l'ascolto e vi do appuntamento al prossimo episodio di Lingue Originali su Caffè Italia. Lingue originali